And you're seeing my slide okay? Yes, I am. Very good. This week three, your primary focus is on doing interviews, and there are some documents available there. And your uh, discussion assignment this week is to look at a range of about a dozen recent news media interviews so that you can evaluate what worked well and what didn't. If there are starter questions, uh, questions associated with them. What I want to talk about amongst us is how to do the interview so that it is a conversation and not a confrontation. And I want to do this from both sides of the microphone because not only have I done a lot of journalistic interviewing, but I've also prepared people to be interviewed. When I was doing public relations work, I would prepare candidates, college presidents, and so forth for being ready to get interviewed by the newspaper or television or radio, and have done a number of them myself where I was the person getting interviewed. Uh, for example, after 9-11, Florida State University put me out pretty much and made me available to every Rotary Club, Lions Club, radio station, whoever needed an expert to comment for them about terrorism and what that was all about in the aftermath of 9-11. So I wound up doing and giving as many interviews as I was teaching. So I will go back and forth between how to do it for you as a journalist and also how I coach people on how to get interviewed by somebody like you. So I'm going to show you the tricks on both sides. That way it's beneficial. Now, most of the time, the reason that you're interviewing somebody is because they have allowed it to happen. You have requested the interview, and this person has said, okay, I will sit down with you, or you can record me over the telephone or Skype or what have you. But they are a willing participant in the interview. This is different than somebody being at a podium at a news conference where lots of people are asking questions at the same time to one person there at the rostrum. But the techniques still apply. When we talk about this being communicating through interviews, I want you to be thinking not just about the questions that you're going to ask, but also be thinking about the answers that you're going to receive. So uh, with one hand, you're taking notes, but with your ears, you're listening to what they had to say. Part of your brain is thinking about a follow-up question. This is a multi-level activity, just as if you were having a conversation with the person sitting next to you on an airplane, that we anticipate what we might say back to them. We try and predict how they're going to finish a sentence. And we're thinking how we're going to phrase things so that they understand it. All of those things are in play in a good interview. You're not likely to be in a position where you can compel an answer from somebody. These people are not under subpoena. They can get up and walk out anytime that they want to. So that you have to be like a fisherman where you are playing with the line, you're reeling them in, you're letting them run with it, you're reeling them in, letting them run with it. There's a lot of feel to this. It's equal parts art and science. So from that perspective, let's figure out how we can sit down with this person, whether it's an ordinary citizen or some celebrity, and we want to engage with them through the process of an interview to get information that we need for our story. And I, I will try and uh, give you some concrete things that you can use to become a better interviewer. So we're going to talk about how to ask effective questions. We're going to talk about how to respond to the answers that you get back from these people. We're going to talk about how these people respond to your questions. And we're also going to talk just as a wrap up as to anything that comes up in your mind about how to do an interview, get an interview, how to behave, and so forth. So that's what we're going to try and cover tonight. Step one, we want you to be asking questions that will get the kind of answer that you need for your story. Just because you get the chance to sit down with some notable person, and in, in this photo here, I'm actually training fire officers on how to do interviews 
like right after a fire or uh, police spokespeople right after a, a crime incident so that they know how to do a live interview going out over TV. But when you prepare your questions, one of the things I was taught uh, when I was uh, in journalism school and when I was first on the job was I should never ask a question where I didn't already have some idea of what the answer was going to be. Now, I'm not necessarily predicting what this person is going to say. I hope they surprise me. I hope they say some interesting things that I didn't anticipate. But I should be doing research in advance of getting this interview to where I have some idea who this person is, what company they work for, what their background is, whether they are for or against whatever topic it is that I'm bringing up to the interview, so that I am as prepared as I possibly can be. I had made arrangements for one of my students one time to get to talk to Coach Steve Spurrier and had arranged a telephone interview, an appointment for that, and had my student there at my desk ready to use the speakerphone. And he was going to interview Coach Spurrier about the upcoming season. And the first question he asked was, so, uh, hey, Coach, um, how you doing? That's not a good question to ask. Maybe he was trying to be polite, but mostly he was frozen up trying just to fill dead air. Now, Coach Spurrier, as would anybody in that level of a position, pretty busy. Pretty nice that he carved out 10 minutes to do a telephone interview with some college student. Spend those 10 minutes wisely, because that might be the only chance you have to get quotes from this person. So anything that you can look up, Anything that you can find online, anything that you can find in documentation to where you don't have to ask your basic who, what, when, where questions and ask them the longer questions of why and how. So doing homework before you ever go do the interview, make sure you're talking to the right person in the right type of organization, that you already have background uh, knowledge as to what it's all about. Another thing my editor taught me was that sometimes we ask these questions to see whether or not they're going to lie to you. So if you have already looked up where they were on such and such a date or what the public budget was for some project, some things that you could have found out through public records, going to the library, going to the courthouse, reading their telephone book ad, looking them up on Google, the facts and figures you could look them up, and then when you ask some of these questions during the interview, you can verify that they're telling you a straight story, that they're uh, making stuff up, and you can then hit them with the actual figures and say, well, now the last fiscal year budget, this was $15 million. Now the legislature says you're $30 million short. How did that happen? That means you've already done your arithmetic. You already have it in your notes and that you can ask stronger questions. Doesn't mean you're trying to catch them. Doesn't mean you're trying to convict them, but it means you see some factual discrepancy. You would like to give them a chance to explain it to you. So you should be armed with robust, meaty questions, not um, spell your name for the record or uh, is that great? Greg with a G or Craig with a C. I should have looked all that up before I ever had the interview booking. Now, the questions that you ask will generally come in one of two flavors. They will be open-ended or closed-ended. Neither is better or worse than the other. They have particular uses. It's like having two different types of screwdriver. These are tools. So let me show you why you would use a closed-ended question. We want to drive the person to give us a simple yes, no, or factual response. This can also be a way for you to control the flow of the interview. So if I construct a question in such a way that they can only say yes, no, Thursday, 55, some sort of short answer, I am keeping them from rambling on. I am keeping them from filibustering their way through my precious 10 minutes of interview time. So I want to hit this stuff as a signpost in my notes, stop the discussion, confirm these facts, and then move forward. 
So a closed-ended question can be a way for you to take charge of the timing and the flow of the interview. When you write these questions, you probably want to start them with is or can or how many signal words that set up the question to where grammatically in this other person's mind, when he or she is trying to formulate the answer to your question, the language is going to drive them to give you a short answer. So they don't get to run away with it because you have sort of presupposed that this question structure leads to a short structure of the answer. And again, you see my note here, you should already have some idea of the correct answer. It may be that you don't know all the facts, and it's important that this person give you some correct or updated information. So the closed-ended question is not necessarily a trick question or a gotcha question. Instead, it can just be a verifying some information and then you can have things correct before you go to write up your story. So the closed-ended question has a particular purpose, and it can be used to good effect. Most of the time, though, we will want to do an open-ended question. We want to structure it to get more than a yes, no, or simple factual response. Think about the kind of stories that you are constructing as a multimedia journalist. You need some audio and video that has some flavor of this person's personality, their thinking, their reasoning, their emotions, their reactions to things. So I want more than a one-second answer to use in my media content. I need them to give me a 10 or 15-second answer. I wouldn't mind if they went 30 seconds and I had the option to cut it up on my desktop later. So I want to stimulate them to discuss the topic with me. I want them to give me longer answers. If you build your question correctly, one of the things that will happen is you will stimulate them to think about it. So if I asked you, what was the best experience you had in high school? I am now forcing you to recall how old was I then? Where was I? Who were my friends? What was something I really liked? And now you're replaying the tapes in your head and remembering things, and you may come up with a funny story or a uh, an emotional anecdote. You might give me some more information, and I, now you're telling me more history. You're giving me more material that I can edit later on. It's perfectly all right to let let these people go a little bit when you hit them with an open-ended question. I remember doing an interview with a couple of old World War II veterans. One was an officer, one was an enlisted man. They had both served under General Patton in Europe, and it turns out after 30 years, these two guys were going to meet each other. The one drove the Jeep for the officers, so they had not seen each other since the war was over. I don't want to get in the way of their emotional reaction. I want to hear them talking. So I'm going to say, how did you feel when you saw Bob after all those years? Well, I thought he got old. I didn't, but I thought he got a lot older. And then they laugh, and I start getting some some camaraderie. I'm getting some feeling from these two guys. So I want to provoke that by the way that I write the questions. See how then this gets me more information on tape. I'm more likely on video to get them to give me more facial expressions. On audio, I'm going to get more material, and I'm going to get more vocal quality, more vocal inflections. Now, notice the note on this particular slide. When you ask an open-ended question, you don't know where it's going to go. You might know something about it, but you can't really predict what memory is going to be stimulated with this person, or what story they might start telling you. So part of your brain is evaluating what you're receiving, and part of it is thinking, wow, he just said something I never knew. I didn't know they served under Patton. Did they get to meet him? I want to ask what Patton was like. So you might need to be opening up follow-up areas that you didn't even know were available to you until this guy started giving his long-winded answer. 
So can you see why you need to have kind of a split brain action going on? I'm trying to listen to them to make sure I'm getting a good answer to the question that I actually posed. But then as their longer answer continues, they may give me some other story angles that I didn't know about. And I want to pursue them, too. Because maybe I don't get to come back and re-interview this person. I got to get everything I'm going to get while we're sitting here together. So part of your brain is paying attention to what you're receiving to make sure that you're getting the answer that you needed for the question that you had planned. But at the same time, you want to be listening for key words or interesting things that you might want to follow up with. Oftentimes, when we attend news conferences, and we have prepared a question in case we get called on, we will actually announce to that person, uh, Joe, I have a question and a follow-up. So I give you my question, I get your answer, and now anticipating what you might say, I have my follow-up question. So what does that mean for next year's team? Because I want to uh, continue on with this, and I haven't given up my time with the microphone yet. So Again, you got to be operating on a couple of levels if you're really going to be efficient and effective in doing the interview process. Here are some tips in order to make this thing work out really effectively. First, you want to ask clear and concise questions. One thing that you will find me doing in the feedback on your written assignments and other activities in this program is that I'm always going to be trying to get you to use the most specific and descriptive word that you can, whether it's a tweet or a headline or a caption or even in an individual sentence. I want you to use the best word possible. When you're composing the questions for an interview, what that means is that you're going to ask with the best possible word to convey what you want to know. So if I say annual budget, does that mean January 1st? Does that mean July 1st, which is a state fiscal year? Does that mean uh, October 1st, which is a federal fiscal year? Or do we mean January 1st, which is a calendar year? Also sometimes called a tax year because we report them based on calendar years. So when I ask a person a question, I want to make sure I say, fiscal year, federal year, calendar year, just to specify what I mean. Or if I was asking a question about a college and I asked what your enrollment was. Well, enrollment, that's just how many times people signed up for classes. That's not head count, which is numbers of human beings. It's not unduplicated head count, which means people who may have signed up for more than one class. It's not full-time equivalent, where we take the number of actual bodies and the number of credits and divide that out by a factor of 12, which is how many hours a full-time student takes. So all of these definitions are important to make sure I'm asking the question that I really need, and I'm saying it in clear and concise language that the other person will understand the exact same way. So the use of technical terms, the use of precise business language or government language or sports language, very important to make sure I ask the question in a way that it's understood correctly and that they will give me back the information that then I can understand correctly to get my story right. Second point, don't be afraid to ask challenging questions. Now, I don't mean hostile questions. Again, you're not a police investigator. You're not here trying to catch them at some crime. Uh, someday, if you happen to get to be a crime reporter or political reporter, we can talk about that later. Most of the time, though, you're just going to ask deep questions that challenge them to call up their emotions, their knowledge, their history with a subject so that they give you more information. It's perfectly all right to ask a coach, why did you call that play with one minute to go? Whether the play worked or didn't work doesn't matter. I want to know, how did his decision-making process work? 
What were his assistant coaches telling him? What were the scouts telling him? Uh, what did the players on the field tell him? How did he put all that information together to decide we're going to do this at this important point of the ball game? So a challenging question just means I'm going for meat. I'm going for quality, quantity and quality of information. I'm not just asking, so uh, that was third down, right, coach? I want to say uh, that the question can be challenging without being hostile, without being confrontational. If we are really successful, the coach will want to explain himself to me. Then I learn more about how that decision's made. I can interpret that better for my readers so they understand why the game turned out like it did. That means I'm getting my job done. Also means the coach gets his job done because he gets to explain why the game turned out like it did. We are in this together. The person who gives you the interview wants to explain himself, wants to express his feelings, information like that, right? At the same time, you need to get this information so that you can do a good job for your readers. Working together, both of you can get your story told. Now, among the interviews that you have on your shopping list for your discussion assignment are some that were absolutely uh, trick questions or gotcha questions where they were trying to actually nail the person live on TV. It is bad form for you to try to tr trick somebody in the course of an interview. We call this sometimes ambush journalism or an ambush question, where they don't even anticipate what's coming up, and then you ask them a question that has nothing to do with what you told them the interview was going to be about. What that does is it ruins your credibility for going back for future interviews. Hillary Clinton has got to know that questions are going to come up about the fundraising that's been done in the foundation's name. That's going to come up when she starts giving interviews during her presidential campaign. Jeb Bush had to know that somebody was going to ask him about what his brother George W. Bush did in making his decision to go to war in Iraq. Most people who are in controversial or high-profile situations know what are the hot topics are that they are likely to get nailed on. So it shouldn't really surprise them. And you will see this in some of the examples that are there, again, in the homework assignment. But I'll tell you how I prepared people when I knew there was something they could get ambushed about. We would practice in the office before the reporter ever arrived. We would sit down and figure out what's the one question we hope they don't ask us tonight. So what is our, our hidden secret or our scandal or our problem or the thing that we don't have solved yet that we hope nobody asks us about? Then we compose what we think would be a good, honest answer to that difficult situation. Knowing that it could come up, we go ahead and prepare for it. We play with some of the words. We draft it. We practice saying it out loud to see how it sounds. Then after the interview is over, if nobody ever asked us that question, we go, we got away with it tonight, but we're going to save that answer in case it comes up later. If it does come up, then our, my client did not look all flustered. And in fact, they had a good prepared answer that adequately explained this troublesome situation. So we expect as celebrities or as handlers of celebrities and candidates and officials, that tough questions could come up. That's the business we're in. You don't get to be famous and powerful without having to deal with difficult stuff. But we kind of know our own business. We know where we're vulnerable. We will be prepared for that question. So don't be afraid as a journalist to ask a question that gets into a sensitive thing. If I was interv if I happen to get a chance to talk to Tom Brady this week, I'm going to ask him about the deflated footballs and the four game suspension and everything. He may say I can't comment because that's under appeal. Okay, but he knows I probably have to ask that question. 
So I don't expect him to get mad or throw a chair at me or something because I dared to ask it. Now let me give you an, an easy, polite trick that you can do to stretch the answer that you could get from somebody. When somebody answers your question, don't immediately move to your next one. Instead, let that question or that answer kind of percolate for a second. Let me give you a, a little example. Listen to what I'm about to do. That was five seconds of total silence. Started to get a little bit uncomfortable because you didn't know what was coming. Nature abhors a vacuum. That's a law of physics. But the same thing is true in conversations that we feel like we have to talk whenever somebody else is not talking. Sometimes we talk over the other person and interrupt them. As an interviewer, I want you to wait. Let them finish what they think the answer was to your question. Let them finish talking. And I have found that if I don't say anything at all for just those five empty seconds, they might think, Oh, he didn't completely understand. Let me say some more about that. And that person might keep talking in order to try and fill up that space. I have even tilted my head a little bit and raised one eyebrow as if I was still listening for the rest of their answer to kind of imply to them what you just told me, pal, is not complete. I want to hear the rest of it. So I'm just going to pause here with my head tilted and my eyebrow up like a little dog, just listening to hear some more from you. I have even let my pen hover above my notepad as if there must be more that I'm going to get ready to write down. You just haven't said enough yet. So between the pen hovering, the little tilted head, the little eyebrow and five seconds of silence, I put the pressure on that other person to keep talking. And most people will because they are uncomfortable when it gets too quiet. Therefore, they may run on and give you more information, give you more insight. You might even get a longer quote that you can edit into your package. So don't be in such a big hurry to get from question number four to question number five. Let their answer to question number four kind of stew for a second in the open silence and see if they happen to add something to it all by themselves. Now, when they answer you, here are a couple of things that you should do. And they come from a technique called active listening, which we use in the counseling professions. One thing that you should do when somebody gives you an answer, especially if it's long, complex, or meandering, is speak it back to them. Acknowledge what you think you heard. So you paraphrase what they said to you back to them to make sure that you have correct understanding of the point that they made. For example, I might need to clarify a fact. I thought he said 15, but it could have been 50. And the difference between 1-5 and 5-0 could be huge. So I might want to say this back to him just to make sure that I heard this correctly. When you get home and you start playing your audio and you're trying to edit it and you're trying to tweak that sound, trying to figure out what did he really say, you might want to make sure that you confirm that before you left. Now, footnote here, it is perfectly acceptable to call somebody later and say, I was going through the interview, and I wanted to double-check a couple of facts with you to make sure I have them right for the story. Fact-checking is always fine. I wouldn't want to have to do that, because I would rather that I had done a good job of getting it collected and accurate already in my notes. But, if need be, you can call them back to clarify. Sometimes you might even read a quote back to somebody and say, I have you down as saying this, word for word for word for word, you read it back to them. 
if they have caught a factual mistake of some kind, maybe you would allow them to correct it. But if they just said something embarrassing and stupid, they don't get to redo that quote. They can't call you later and say, man, I didn't mean to say that. Can I take that out of your story? Because they don't get to be your editor. Understand that it is a courtesy that you don't have to do to call them back and check a quote or check a fact. I would rather that you did that at that same sitting. If somebody flubs their line that they were trying to say to you and they start coughing or something and they would like to say it again and let you re-record it, that's okay. That's acceptable. But not if they're going to change their answer because they said something bad and they want to take it out of the story. So you understand the difference between those. It's all right to clean up a quote if somebody said something that was grammatically incorrect or they dropped a G at the end of a verb and you want to put that G on it or you want to leave the G off because you're trying to capture their country and casual way of saying things. Either is acceptable. That's a judgment that you have to make as the gatekeeper for the story. Look at this last point that I make, capturing the essence in your notes. When you go out to do a story, I don't care how sophisticated the equipment is that you have. You have these top-of-the-line MacBook Pros. You got your super Sony cameras. Don't trust your electronics. Have a pencil and paper notebook with you to go with all of your electronic stuff. Batteries die. Tapes get garbled. Background noise screws up stuff. Anything could happen. I prefer to trust a pencil and a piece of paper even more than a pen because a pen can run out of ink. I can at least take a pocket knife and sharpen a pencil by hand if necessary. So one way or another, I want to make sure I get my notes. I can also be writing in the margins of my notes, notes to myself that at this point, um, he made a good face. I want to make sure I have that that footage in my final package. Or this was funny. I want to make sure I put this in. And I make little marks and uh, symbols and circle stuff all over my notebook to remind me that this quote was good, that one stunk, so on and so on, so that I'm kind of editing in my notebook while I'm listening to this um, interview take place. Lastly, let me give you a physical tip on how to navigate your notebook. And even the art of the reporter's notebook is a separate thing. If you've ever seen a 5 by 7 or 6 by 8 stenographer's notepad, like secretaries used to carry, those are twice as wide as a pants pocket or an inside coat pocket. So what we used to do was cut those in half lengthwise so that we had a tall, skinny notebook that we could stick inside our suit pocket or in the hip pocket of our jeans for going out to do stories. I still have a bunch of them. I still keep them in my camera bag or when I'm going out attending meetings that I might want to write up later because I don't want to be lugging around a bunch of equipment. But I at least want to have these little handy flip uh, reporter's notebooks. And here's a habit that I was taught years ago. Instead of having my list of 10 questions all written one through 10 on the first sheet of my notebook, instead, I put question number one at the top of page one. Question number two goes at the top of page two. That way, as I am receiving my answer to question number one, I've got the whole front and back of that sheet of paper to write down what he said, write down some figures, make notes to myself of follow-up questions. I've got some room to work. Then question number two starts on its own fresh piece of paper. And again, I have plenty of room to work. So if I have 10 questions, I prepare 10 pages, each with a question at the top, so that I have room to do my uh, notations. I don't want to be trying to write a bunch of information in between single lines on a cramped page. I want to give myself plenty of room to write, draw, 
draw maps, write down phone numbers, whatever may come up in the context of each individual question. So I treat each question with its own sheet of paper. All right. To wrap up, Sherry, do you feel like we covered what the agenda was for tonight? Some practical tips on how to be successful in doing an interview? Um, I do, and I didn't raise my hand a whole lot because as you were talking, you know, I'm a note taker, so I was kind of taking notes and have some Good. questions that I'd like to ask when you're done. Okay, great. Um, that comes under anything else. What are some, what are some things that uh, came to mind while we were going through it? Um, well, this is something that I observed. I kind of made a note about when I was doing my last interview that kind of talked along the lines of waiting five seconds before asking your next question. Right. Um, when I, well, I take my notes on my iPad. That's just easier for me. Um, sure. But when I would be writing down what she was saying, if it took me a little too long, you, I did notice that she would start talking again. And I hadn't necessarily indicated that I was giving a new question, but I noticed that that does work. Like she thought that I was waiting for more information. So a lot of the information that I got, I really didn't have to ask that many questions because she just kind of, she, she was a natural talker. And you had and so when it got quiet, she just filled in the spaces. So most of my interview, I think I only asked like five questions. But if you had good starter questions that got her motivated to talk, then you could let her roll. And then when she felt like there was too much silence, as we said earlier, she felt that natural need to fill that in. So it sounds like you had good, effective, open-ended questions in your plan. And if you got her opened up, then she was able to continue. So it turns out this stuff works whether we mean it to or not. Yeah. And then so that, that kind of is my follow-up then, because a lot of times her answers did tend to be very long. And, you know, as you said, when you're thinking about your next questions or where to take the interview next based on your subject's answers, there were some times that I just kind of needed her to stop talking for a little bit so we could kind of get the interview back on track. But what is the polite way to signal to your subject that perhaps they, because I didn't want to interrupt what you were saying. But if the information was not necessarily usable and I could tell, you know, based on the plan that I wanted to take the interview, I wanted to kind of redirect it back, how do you indicate perhaps to your subject that you kind of want to want them to stop talking so okay. that you can get back on track without being rude? Right. Here's a teacher's trick. And... Um... It, it works for me in large lecture classes. When I feel that um, I have explained a topic adequately to my class, what I'm looking for are a lot of people who have stopped taking notes or are looking at me and smiling and nodding a little bit, which is sort of a nonverbal cue from them. We got it. We understand. You can move on. So then I will move on to my next point. If I see a lot of people looking at me, still making notes, and they got squinched up eyebrows, and they kind of got their shoulders up like I don't get it, then I know I need to come up with another example, or I need to draw something on the board, because the facial expression from my audience is telling me they're lost. So what if, when you feel like you got enough information from her, you look up from your notebook, Make eye contact with her and smile and give her a little head nod that says, got it. Okay. And see, then you've told her politely because you smiled and you made eye contact that I understand. That was all I needed to know. And that then gives her a nonverbal cue. Whew, she understands. I can stop talking. So I would try that. I would try um, just some eye contact, a little smile, a little head nod that indicates got enough. Okay. I would not I would not raise my hand or raise a finger or anything like that because that can be sort of um, confrontational or dominant in, in your body language. But okay. I think smiling and nodding at people 
is considered polite. I mean, even if you just pass somebody on the sidewalk and they say good morning and you just smile and nod, we consider that to be polite. That was an, an adequate response to you saying good morning to me if I just smile and nod at you and made some eye contact. I don't need to go into a, a speech with you, but I at least acknowledged you were a human and you were nice and I was nice back at you. So I would try that technique. If you want to cut somebody off, just give them a little uh, nod and smile, and then uh, that ought to be sufficient to let them know that you understand. Okay. And then my next question kind of um, goes kind of back and forth between our last week's assignment and this week. Um, based on what you talked about, I felt like a lot of the strategies here related a lot to like investigative type reporting. But with what we did last week, the narrative feature, the outcome is a little, to my mind, just a little different because you're not necessarily reporting I mean, you are reporting information, but the focus is on the subject with narrative feature right. writing. But you still, Whereas, you still need to ask them good questions to draw out of them their life story or their incident or whatever it is that made them interesting to you. So these techniques will work for feature interviews just as well as if you were doing a hard news interview. I was interviewing an artist from France, a, a famous cartoonist, and I used these very same techniques to get him to tell me more about his life and his career. And at one point, I said, I noticed that early in your career, your drawings were much darker with a heavier line. They were, they were thicker. They were bolder. And then it seemed like in the second half of your career, your line technique was much thinner and your drawings were much more open and more light. And I was wondering, was that a conscious change that you made? And he says, well, that was about when I got off heroin. And he started explaining that once he got off drugs and was less depressed and became a vegetarian and became more healthy, that it was reflected in his artwork because he felt lighter and happier and more open. So by asking him a good question, I was getting a lot out of him. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to investigate his drug habit. I didn't even know he had a drug habit. I just noticed that his style of drawing had changed from the first half to the second half of his career. But by asking a question that said, why did that happen? Then he just opened up and said, I didn't know anybody noticed this, but let me explain. And he went on about all of that. And that became the biggest part of the story that I never even knew. So personality stories and narrative stories work just as well with these same techniques because you still need to use some open-ended questions to draw people out. You still need to use some closed-ended questions to take control of the flow of the interview. So these techniques all still work. Sometimes, and I think maybe this could be part of what you were driving at, when you're interviewing somebody that is just a nice, interesting person who is doing something in the community that you want to tell their story, um, it's a friendly interview. It's not you against them. It's you with them. So they're not really trying to withhold information from you. They're not trying to hide stuff. You're not trying to suck it out of them, okay. which in, in a news uh or business standpoint, or a crime reporting standpoint, I might have to be tougher to get my information. But my process is still me having to talk to some other person and to get them to give me their story. So it doesn't matter if I'm talking to some, uh, I've actually done jailhouse interviews where they lock the door behind me while I'm talking to them. So I've been in bad situations where I had to talk to bad people. And I've been in lovely situations with nice people. And these techniques, I use them in both places. And that, that clarified that for me because I, I think you had the nail on the head. And that's how I felt when I thought about my interview from last week. I was like, well, I didn't really have to do a whole lot to get the information out of her. Um, so I was kind of like it felt um, like I might not necessarily need to do that, but you know, the examples that you gave, you're right, it is investigative reporting, but just the level of difficulty will change depending on the subject. So my questions and approach 
you know, might be tougher, the more difficult the subject well, is to be. Well, let me separate a term for you. There's a difference between in-depth reporting and investigative reporting. In-depth reporting, you're trying to find out who this person is, where they come from, what they're all about, what they're trying to accomplish. And it could be a person, it could be a business, it could be a, a sports team, it could be a band, it could be all kinds of things. But it's in-depth because you're trying to find out why and how this thing is going on. An investigative story is one where you're going after a story that doesn't want to get found. OK, so the investigative uh, reporting is where you're trying to go get a story that does not want to reveal itself. So when you're going after a scandal or a government corruption or uh, some dirty business, you have to be more investigative because you do have to work it more like a detective. But if you're doing an in-depth story about uh, some success or even some tragic thing that you're trying to do a charitable story about it, like you want to do a story about the earthquake over in Kathmandu, right? That's in-depth reporting because you got to tell the story of those people in that country. But it's not investigative because you're not going to expose how earthquakes happen. They just do, right? So there's there's no corrupt criminal thing that made an earthquake happen. Just tectonic plate shifted, earthquake occurred. Now you want to do an in-depth story about who these people are and what they're suffering from and how to help them and tell their story. That's in-depth. That's not investigative. So the in-depth story could be a story that wants to be told and needs to be told. The investigative story is the story that needs to be told but doesn't want to. See the difference? Yes. And that clarified a whole lot of stuff for me just now, so that helped. Well, that's why um, we do all this teaching. <laughs> because I was confused, you know, I'm, I'm still um, from way back at the beginning of um, the program when, uh, when one of the classes with Meredith, when she suggested that we look at the news and read news stories and kind of try to analyze the slant that they were coming from, uh, the more I've understood, the easier that's gotten to be. But then. You know, she also told me back then that it's very rare that a story is black and white one kind. It has elements of others. And now that I'm doing the interviewing and the reporting, trying to understand that there's so many facets to interviewing as well, depending on the type of story you want to put out. And I just didn't have words until now. <laughs> kind well, of for I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you two things, and then I got to get set up for next hour's class. When I was in college, we actually separated investigative reporting and in depth reporting for the State College Journalism Awards because almost nobody in college was doing investigative reporting. Very few college uh, newspaper writers were out there looking into crime and uh, corrupt business and politics and stuff like that. They did do plenty of in-depth reporting about research and sports and uh, fine arts and things where they did plenty of good long form stories that had lots of details to them. But very few of us were out there um, hiding in alleyways, taking pictures with infrared film, trying to catch people doing dope deals or something. OK, so the whole category of investigative reporting kind of fell out of the college journalism contest because nobody was doing it. But they were doing in-depth reporting. So uh, that that's one uh, important distinction that uh, most people in college will never run into this. Sadly, then once they get on the job, they don't know how. So I would encourage my students, yeah, go ahead and cover stuff out in the city. If it affects the college, uh, there's a new business development going in across the street that's going to have apartments for students. Yeah, you can cover that. I can see a way to make that uh, worthwhile to a college readership. But there have been times when I actually had to go after corrupt officials. And uh, work investigative reporting to where, um, yeah, it was like being a crusading newspaper man. 
and you were trying to go get stories that didn't want to get found. That happened very rarely, even when I was on the job full time. So let's say in, in a month at work, I might write two or three stories a day. I might be lucky to do one or two a month that had any investigative aspect to them where I was actually down at the police department or I was down at the hall of records or, or doing any of that kind of thing, trying to dig up dirt on stuff because it just doesn't happen that often. Most of the time we're going to do straight reporting, but even in telling the story of a corrupt government official, right? I'm doing investigative work. I will probably still use some narrative technique to try and tell the timeline of how this crime took place. So I'm still going to be a storyteller. I'm still going to want to paint a word picture of this corrupt weasel that I'm trying to expose. So even though I'm doing investigative work primarily, I will use some of my other techniques in order to embroider the edges of this portrait I'm making. That makes sense. Otherwise, we don't get a three-dimensional picture of this guy that we're trying to run out of town. Okay? Yes. All right. I'm going to go ahead and shut her down and process this recording and get set for the next hour. Okay. All right. Hope you found it helpful, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Okay. All right. Have a good evening. Good night.